And so we know, I think we use our brains and we know it's no surprise that God, for our sakes, includes in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, in the central characters of, of the Bible, two people who go through circumstances, who face situations that are hard to understand. And that speaks to us because we all face the same things, don't we? We face things, that, Lord, I can't figure this out. Things that, God, this is not fair. Um, we pray, pray, pray fervently, and God does not answer our prayer. Things come into our lives that are definitely, they are not good. And you know what? There's no, there's no question about it. Um, and, I, and I'm not trying to be super spiritual or whatever. I'm not being super spiritual. There are things that come into our lives. It's not from God. It's not from God. It's, it's bad. It's bad. I can tell you right now, God doesn't send cancer. He doesn't. Cancer is from the devil. It's from the devil. And, and other things, too. I'm just using that just as an example. Because we live, we live in a fallen, broken world with the effects of sin. And we are here in this world until one day we get to heaven. Whether it is through the doorway of death or whether it is through the doorway of our transfiguration, transfiguration the rapture, when Jesus comes again for us. And we deal with these things and there, so there are things that we face things that we don't understand and we've looked at we've looked at abraham and abraham is um abraham in a way in a way it's the easier one i, I really think that abraham is the easier one for us because abraham as we said it was so clear abraham heard god's voice and he knew it was god right so for you and for me if we have grown to know God, and we hear God's voice leading us in a way, even when it's really hard for us to stay, understand, we have this confidence because we know it's God, even when it's hard, even when we can understand, can under, can't understand, and we can hold on to that because it's okay, God, I don't understand. This is really dark. This is really heavy for me, but God, I've heard your voice, and so I'm holding on to you. I'm holding on to you. Per and, and that's what we see when we come through Abraham, uh, God asking Abraham to offer up Isaac. And, and Abraham deliberately, with all of his heart, immediately ob obeying and submitting to the Lord. And as a reminder, we say, well, I'm, I'm not that far along in the Lord. I don't know if I could do that or not. Well, I don't know if I could do that either. But remember, God had brought Abraham through times of faith building. And so I encourage you this morning, God is not going to bring you to something or call something of you that he has not allowed you to build a foundation for in your life. I, I, I believe that with all of my heart. And God's call to Abraham to give up Isaac was not, was not to show him you're going to fall but it was, it was a testing and a proving. Of course God already knew that Abraham was going to offer up Isaac. But do you know what, brothers what I, and sisters, what I have found and what you have found in your life as well is there are times, many times, when God already knows that we're going to say yes to God and yet God still proves us, proves us in these areas, doesn't he? Even in areas that we have committed. Has God ever proven you in an area that you've already committed to the Lord? Because Abraham had committed his life and his family to God. Isaac was a gift from God um, to, to both of them. And yet there was a proving in that area of greatest commitment. And I find that as we go on with the Lord, so don't be discouraged and don't, don't give up and don't think there's sin, there's sin. God proves us in these areas that are deepest and dearest to our heart. And as he leads us along, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But when we come to Paul, as we look at this morning, I think we come to, into um, a situation and a per and, and something that he goes through that I think it's harder f to understand because as we're going to see this morning this is not initially it's not God's voice it's not God's it is not God's work as it begins and so I think this helps us this morning as well because we all face things like this as well right and so we look at this um, we look at this and we see Paul's experience it's recorded in the New Testament in just a few verses this morning. And um, some people, as we look at this, let's look at the, the next slide in 2 Corinthians 12. And I'm really going to kind of cut it. I'm cutting uh, parts of it. We're going to look at the whole thing in just a minute, but I'm really cutting parts of it so we can focus this morning. So look at me. So Paul 
says, There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Uh, the word elated, what's another word for elated? Proud. Uh, elated sometimes can be puffed up or overjoyed or really elated. So that's, that's another expression for it. But I would like us to focus just mostly on this part. There was given me a thorn in the flesh. And so I want us to, as we think about that, and when, so when did this happen in Paul's life? And we don't know exactly, but in fact, if we put the New Testament together and we look at different things and we compare the book of Acts and we compare different scriptures, this probably happened not so, so late into Paul's Christian life. It wouldn't have been right at the beginning, but it would not have been so, so far into Paul's Christian life. But when he writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, as far as we know, 2 Corinthians was written around, uh, around 55 AD, roughly, okay? Around 55 AD. So this is probably, oh, this is, it would have been many years after this happened to him. And Paul has not even talked about it before now. He hasn't even written about it before now. And this is going to be important as we look at this this morning. And it will help us. And so as we look at this, and we come to this, and we're going to look at Paul, but we're going to look at for ourselves as well. When God tested Abraham, the voice was clear. Abraham. And Abraham replies, God, here I am. Paul's situation is different. It is a messenger of Satan. Is there any question about that? There's no question. It is a messenger of Satan. So a messenger, for example, uh, 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 Caroline, would you come here just a minute? Caroline says, <gasps> what? Come, come here. Come here just a minute. Let's do, let's, I told we're, we're going to be a little bit different. Okay? Okay, come here, Caroline. Okay, come right up here. Okay. Okay. Jean, what was the message? <laughs> she didn't hear. <laughs> what was the message? She loved me. No, I love you. <laughs> Caroline loves you too. Okay. Um, who, who told it to you? Caroline. Caroline. Who sent Caroline? I did. Who's the, who is the source? Who's the messenger? Okay. Now, we are, you say, yeah, 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 I know that. But that gives us a, a, a practical example. So as we look at the life of Paul, he says it's a messenger of Satan. Where does it come from? Where's the source? Satan. 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 What is the messenger? We don't know exactly. We'll talk about this in just a minute. But I think when we talk about a messenger of Satan, what we can usually say is, is that it is demonic in some way, right? It's demonic in some way. Um, just as the Lord, does the Lord send his messengers? Yes. Uh, sorry, his, sorry, does the Lord send his own messengers? Yes. 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 Who are the Lord's messengers? Angels. Sometimes the Lord uses us as well to be his messengers. In the biblical terms, it's, it's an angel. Just in, this, in the same way, Satan uses his messengers, um, which, who are, which, are, which are demons. And so we see this, and Paul says what? He says, it's a messenger of Satan. This is not God. This is not God's voice. This is not God's messenger. And it is not good. Yeah? So that helps me right off. Because I look at my own life and I look at some things that have happened and there are things in my life, things over time that have happened to me, whether through health, whether in my family, or through touching things that I have loved that have been bad, that have obviously not come from God. And so as I look at Paul, I can understand, I, can, I, I can't yet understand, but I can begin to see, yeah, me too. Can you say that? Yeah. Me too. And so we look at this, and so I want to ask you something. What or who is this messenger of Satan? Let's look at the next slide. Paul says, okay, let's stop there. Paul says, it is a thorn in the flesh. How many of you have ever had a thorn in your flesh before? A literal thorn, not, not spiritual or not figurative. How many have ever had a thorn in your flesh? Where, where was it? 
in your finger. For me, you know, I was a country girl, and I would always play outside barefoot. And some of you may say, ooh, but you know it was in the country. I played barefoot outside, and I would run around, and I cannot tell you. Can you imagine me? I was dirty. I was whatever. I was playing with sticks and things like that. Um, and I would play barefoot outside, even when Mom would say, now put your shoes on, because I'd be, you know, we were out in the woods and whatever. I cannot tell you how many times I would come in in the evening, would be sitting there, and I would say, Mom, except I was small. Instead of saying thorn, I called it a sticker. I don't know what you called it. I called it a sticker. Mama got a sticker in my foot. Mama got a sticker in my foot. You know what mom would do? She would get out the magnifying glass and she would get, Kim is going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kim, that's happened. Kim, have you done that for your children? Oh, okay. Or it happened to you. And, there, and then she would get, she would get a needle. You got to get a needle. Yeah. Stephen, did that happen to you? It happened Sorry. many times back in Uganda, right? And she would get it and she would dig it out. And, oh, it hurt. And I would be pulling. I'd be jerking. She'd say, hold still, hold still. It hurt. It hurt. But it was my fault because I've been ro running around barefoot. And so we see this when we look at what Paul says and we say, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. And so we think of something like that. And I don't know about you, but when when I think about that, it's not very serious, is it? It doesn't sound like such a big deal. Um, stay with, stay with me. It sounds like well, just something that's small, and it can be, it can be dug, it can be dug out, and it's painful. But it's just, it's just a small thing. It's just, just a short thing. What I want to say to you this morning is, Paul, who was so gifted in language and in writing, truly one of the most educated men of his day, he does not use the word for a small thorn or sticker when he says there was given me a thorn in the flesh. What word does he use? Let's look at the next part. He used a word, he used the word scallops, and I don't know that word, it's in Greek, but that word is very different. Let's click again. It means a stake. And this is what the word means, brothers and sisters. It meant a stake, not a little thorn, but a stake that was something big, something that would be driven. And this is how it was used. It was driven into the flesh. It would have been, it would be similar to what, uh, when Jesus was crucified, the nails that pierced Jesus. It's that type of stake. It would be used to impale a person or something like that. So it's not something small. So I want us to understand as we look at this this morning, when, when Paul says, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to to, to torment me, this is what he means. It wasn't something small. It wasn't something light. And I say that to you this morning, and I think, and I'm not trying to draw it out and make something up that is not there, but to help us understand, for some of us that have gone through things or are going through things, in your life, it feels like a stake in your heart and in your skin and in your body and in your heart, doesn't it? That's what it feels like. And I want to tell you something. Do you know why it feels that way? Because that is what it is. It's not something light. It's not something small. And it's a messenger of Satan. And Paul says there was given me this stake that went into me. And it, I, we're going to talk about this just, just, a, just a little bit further. I, I want us to as we consider this. So it's a stake. It's used to impale someone. It is from Satan, so it's not something minor. And I want to ask you something this morning as we look at this. What is it and who, or what or who is it? Do you know that as I was studying, the Bible scholars have all sorts of ideas about what it is. Some people say it was false teachers and prophets who came into the church and they drew people away from, from Paul and brought him grief to his heart. And I can imagine that because Paul loved the church and his heart was so grieved. So it could have been a person or a group of people. A lot of Bible teachers and a lot of Bible scholars instead believe that it was um, a, a, a temptation that Paul that Paul had. He didn't give in to it, but it was a it was a constant temptation, a constant weakness that he wanted to that he wanted to overcome, that he wanted to go beyond, that he wanted to grow beyond, but that it was always there and he had to he had to in the Lord's strength stand against it. Now please don't think you're saying, well that's kind of heretical. I don't I don't know about that. 
there are many Bible scholars, good Bible scholars, who really believe that. That that was something that all of his life he had to stand against it. No, God, in your strength, in your strength. Have you ever in your own life, there's something and you just think, God, get rid of it, get rid of it in my life. And, and God doesn't? Or, or, and, and it's still there? It might fall in this category then. Or it might be someone that is around that is a constant torment to you. And that person is still there. The majority of Bible scholars believe that it was something physical in Paul's life. For me, that's what I tend to think. But I'm not a, a Greek expert. Um, but most, the majority of Bible scholars believe that it was something physical in his body. Have some of you gone through physical things that you're struggling with that, that just don't go away? You've prayed and prayed and prayed and they just haven't gone away then you may fall in this category, that if, if that's what it is. It was, it was likely something physical. But I want us to see something else as well. Paul doesn't say what it is. Why doesn't he? I think in part, he doesn't say what it is because it makes it more general for you and for me this morning, right? It's something that, yes, I struggle with this as well. There's another reason that Paul doesn't say what it is. Do you know why Paul doesn't say what it is? He doesn't say what it is because very clearly the Corinthian believers knew what it was. They knew what it was. It wasn't something secret. It wasn't something hidden. It was something that they could see in some way in Paul's life. Whether it was a person or a group or a struggle, a temptation or a physical thing, they could see it in Paul's life. Now, if that's what it is, and most Bible scholars think that's what it is, this is what we know. It is in his flesh, and it causes great torment. The word torment means to buffet, to harass, to beat upon the face with fists. That's what that word means. And that's how Paul feels this, whatever it is, this is how Paul feels it. Now when I look at that, I think about Paul and then I think about some of the things that I have gone through. And I want us to understand it and look at it in this way. When Paul went through this, what this meant was, whatever it was, it humbled him in front of other believers. It humbled him. In other words, in other words, here is the great Paul. And the great Paul is suffering from this? Here's the great Paul. He doesn't have enough faith to pray and God will take this out of his life? Here's the great Paul. He lays hands on people and they are raised up in health from death to life, from sickness to healing. Here's the great Paul and he speaks a judgment of God and somebody is, loses his sight for a certain time. That was all true in Paul's life. Here's the great Paul and this is in his life. He must not be so great after all. He thinks he's the great apostle, but he's not. Look at him. I don't suffer that. I don't struggle with that. Or if it was a temptation in some way, hmm, I don't suffer from that temptation. That's not in my life. And so that's what Paul faced. And as people looked at his life, that's what they, that is what some would have thought about Paul. Now I want to ask you something this morning. We're looking at Paul, but I want to ask you something. When you have gone through things in your life that have been hard to understand and you have prayed, God, take this out of my life. God, heal me. God, save me. God, deliver me from this. May I say something to you this morning? There are times when we go through things when instead of receiving help and comfort from other Christians, instead, other Christians look at us and our Christian lives and they judge us. Mm? And they have a word from God for us. Oh, you need to pray more. Or they come to us and they say, the reason this is in your life is because, fill in the blank, yeah? This has happened to you because, blah, 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 blah. I remember in our family when 
when my brother went through all oh, when he was so 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 far and there were people who came to my parents in their sadness and in their broken heart and basically said this has happened because basically you're not really very good parents that's what that's what they said to them yes if you had been better parents and if you would do this 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 and this then everything would be okay talk about kicking somebody when they're down talk about putting a greater burden on them and I can imagine as we look at this that Paul would have struggled with some of that just as you and I struggle with that at times when we go through things and and it is hurtful and it is hard isn't it when people come to us and basically they have an answer for us and our situation when God himself has not answered us and our prayers when God himself has been silent about what is going on in our lives but oh they can tell us what has gone on in our lives right now I don't want to camp on there too long because it's easy to start getting angry isn't it and it's see it's easy to start getting upset about that but all of us all of us have faced that so if you're going through that I am sorry for that may God help us that that is not how we treat our brothers and sisters who go through hard times now may the Lord bring a message from him to somebody he may at times but may I say something to you we must be very 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 careful about that we must be very careful or many times people may come to us and basically say without saying um, you just don't have enough faith has anybody ever said that to you if you had more faith this would happen I want to say something to you this morning if anybody had faith it was Abraham if anybody had faith it was Paul and yet the situation remained with him now how does Paul deal with this messenger of Satan look at the next slide and it says Paul says three times I pleaded I begged with the Lord to take it away from me and you say well just three times I've prayed more than that don't look at it in that way don't look at it in that way I think what we can understand is over time as Paul dealt with this there would have been an extended period of persistent prayer as Paul came back to the Lord and said God deliver me from this was Paul's prayer wrong no it wasn't wrong Paul's prayer this is a messenger of Satan whatever it was was damaging to him whatever it was he could see this is hampering me whatever it was this was limiting me a lot of people believe it was a problem with his eyesight and you say wait 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 some people uh, believed all sorts of things but a lot of people a lot of Bible scholars believe it was something wrong with his eyes because in another place in another scripture he says do you remember what he says he says look I have written to you with such large letters implying it would not have been so easy but he wrote very very large perhaps because he himself couldn't see very well in another place do you remember what he says he says you loved me so much if you could have plucked out your eyes and given them to me you would have done that so it may have been it may have been something like that we don't know we truly don't know but some people believe that as well but Paul obviously he looked at this it was not a wrong prayer it is a prayer to that he prayed from his heart that he prayed in faith that he prayed with persistence and understand something as we look at this, at this this morning and be encouraged Paul was not in sin he had not done something wrong there was not judgment upon his life now can the Lord work when we choose wrongly and when we're going the wrong way and do things yes he can but this was not the case for Paul he wasn't going the wrong way he wasn't in sin when this came to him and he didn't have a lack of faith either as we're going to see but it was prayer over a period of time so as we look at this we say well God why didn't you answer this prayer but the more important question I think this morning as I look at Paul is Lord why don't you answer some of my prayers because that's where we are this morning this is not a history lesson this is an object lesson for you and for me this morning so not a history lesson an object lesson for us and so we look at this and we can understand Paul's situation it's hard it's hurtful it's confusing it's limiting why would not God 
answer Paul's fervent and faithful prayer? Why does God not answer our faithful and our fervent prayers as well? We learn in part from Paul's further writings. Let's look at what comes next. And then Paul says, many, many years later, to keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations of heaven, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. And now we begin to understand. It came from the enemy. It came to cause Paul torment. But God had a greater purpose in using it for good in Paul. Though Paul could not, undersee, uh, could not understand and he could not see it at the time. And that helps me this morning, and I hope it helps you. Me, as I said last week or the week before, I cannot understand why God would not heal my mother's eyes. She has served God faithfully all her life. Since, since she was a young girl, she has given her life for the sake of the gospel. I am in large part who I am this morning, except for the weak parts and things like that. I am who I am because of my mother and because of my father. But especially my mother's prayers as she has prayed and, the, and what she has poured into this church and into many of your lives. And so I truly do, brothers and sisters, and pardon the tears in my eyes and whatever, but I continue to pray. I haven't stopped praying because God has not yet said to me, my grace is sufficient for mom. Stop praying. <laughs> Stop praying. God hasn't said that to me, so I keep on praying. And I'm faithful and I'm pers persistent. But you have situations in your life with, your own, with yourself or with loved ones. And, you're, and you feel the same way, don't you? It may be a loved one that has not yet come to the Lord. And me, I still, I don't understand. God, it would be a good thing. God, it would be so easy for you. God, why don't you? God, you could. God, you could. And there have been other things in my life that I've prayed for as well. Um, about five weeks ago, as I, as I was praying, some of you are going to kind of laugh but don't laugh too loud because it's still very close to my heart. Um, you know I sometimes talk about my cat Lucy, right? And now you're going to laugh. You say, from your mom's eyes to your cat? Yes. Yes, because I believe God gave me that orange kitty cat that nobody else loved except me. Um, and I've talked, about, I've talked about her before. And about, uh, about five weeks or so ago, um, I had to put her to sleep. And I didn't tell anybody at the time because it broke my heart. And it still breaks my heart because I loved her so much because I believe God gave her to me. And by the way, I am not comparing my cat to the things that you go through. I understand that. But we go through things, and, and I can laugh a little bit now, but not very much yet. Um, but, you know, I, I, she reached 21, and, and I don't want to take a long time because we have more serious things to talk about. But um, in, the, in the last weeks of her life, the last month or so, um, I prayed for God to let her go to sleep. I really did. And in the last five weeks or so of her, of her life after 21 years, she, without going into details, she suffered terribly. I, I, and without going into details, it was truly awful. It was truly, it was, I would grieve and I would cry and I would beg the Lord. I would say, Lord, please let her go to sleep and not wake up. I, I asked the vet. I, I begged the vet when he came, please put her to sleep, please put her to sleep, because I saw the suffering, and the vet wouldn't do it until the very, very end, and it was awful. And I still look at that, and, and I have accepted it because God is a good God, brothers and sisters. God is a good God, but I did. And, and, you, and you all say, you're talking about your cat again? Yeah, talking about my cat, it, because I loved her so much. And I, I couldn't understand, God, why didn't you just, just let her go to sleep? You could have because of the, the, the torment that she went through and the torment that I went through. And I don't understand. But what I know is this. God is still a good God. And God, what God gives us through hard times, it's enough. It's sufficient, as we see in the life of Paul. So, so don't camp on the... And you don't have to come to me after the service and say, Oh, Pastor Jennifer, I'm sorry, or whatever. You know, um, God, has, God, has, 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 God has helped my heart. And, and, he, and he has. And that's why I didn't say anything about it or whatever. Um, but it, brought, it did bring great grief to my life. But you all have faced things that are of greater con consequence and more eternal things. And it's brought great grief to your lives as well, hasn't it? 
I know it has. We go through things we think, God, I don't understand. And it seems bad and not good. And you know what? It is bad and it's not good. But Paul helps us this morning. And we see when we don't understand, and this is what I want us to come to this morning, we see and we don't understand. God help us to see when we don't understand God's hand above the hard things, God's love that still surrounds, God's heart for you and for me when we don't have an answer and when we don't understand. He is still God. The devil has not suddenly grabbed God's plans for your life and said, Ugh, because I hate you, I'm going to mess up God's plans for your life. Because that's what we think, isn't it? We think the devil's gotten in this and he's messed up God's good, good things in my life. What I want us to see this morning is that God's hand is higher. God's hand is greater. God's heart is more loving than Satan's hate against you. God's good will for you is greater than Satan's ill will for you this morning. And Paul, many years later, many years later, can then, or we don't know how much later Paul understood, what we know is this, he did not understand at the time, okay? You say, Pastor Jennifer, how can you say that? I'll show you in just a minute. Paul did not understand at the time, just like some of us don't understand right now, right? So hold on to that. Paul says, after the fact, looking back, to keep me from being conceited, to keep me from being too elated. And it's not surprising, and I think God, the Holy Spirit, wants us to see this. He, with me this morning? He wants us to see this. Two times, Paul says, to keep me from being conceited to keep me from being too elated. At the beginning and at the end of this passage, he puts it in there. Now he understands. Now he understands. Oh, this was the purpose in the messenger of Satan. Didn't come from God. The bad things in your life have not come from God, but God can have a purpose in bad things. God can have a control over these things. And so we see this, and I want us to see this. God does not say to Paul, Paul, stop praying at first. He doesn't say, Paul, stop praying this way because you're going to be too conceited and you're going to be too puffed up. I have given you a revelation of so many things. I've, I've, shown, you myself, my, I've shown you my heart and myself. You've heard my voice audibly. And if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, go to the beginning and you will see that at the beginning of chapter 12 in 2 Corinthians, God took Paul, whether in a vision or in his body, God took Paul to heaven. Didn't die. Some people have a death experience or whatever and God does something wonderful. It wasn't even that. In the beginning of chapter 12, Paul says, he uses the third person. That was the custom to do it that way. But whether it was a vision or in the flesh, he didn't know God took Paul to heaven. Why did God do that? Because he loved Paul better than he loves you and me? No. No. He loves each one of us equally. But God had a special call on Paul's life. He was going to go through the deepest, darpest, darkest things. He was going to serve God. He was going to go through such, such satanic opposition in the gospel that he would have to have something from God that would hold him for the battle that was ahead. May I say something to you this morning? There are revelations of God, great blessings of God sometimes, that he poured, that he pours into your life and into my life. And yes, God loves us. But may I say this to you this morning? Gear yourself for the battle. Because sometimes God gives us his blessing. Sometimes God gives us his revelation. And we're like, oh, isn't this great? Now, and I'm not mocking you this morning. Oh, this is great. It's more than that. It's more than that. God gives us of himself of his love, of a revelation of himself, most often that you and I may go through the battle, that we will make it, that we will not fail, that we will not fall, but they will, that we will go through. And not only that we will go through for ourselves, 
But oh, brothers and sisters, our lives are not our own. We have been bought with a price. You think God wants to get just you to heaven? He wants more than that. He wants you and me as we go to heaven just to be bringing people with us to heaven one day. He wants others' lives to be impacted and affected by our lives that we come victoriously before God. Not only that, but that we come bringing our family members. And many times you may think, well, I'm not a Paul. I'm not, a, I'm not an Amor. I'm not a Pastor Vivian. I'm not a Pastor Renna. Maybe not. But God has given you a sphere of influence. God has given you people. They listen to you. Their hearts are open to you. You're the one that God will use to bring them with you. And God will pour blessings upon you. God will give you truth. God will give you understanding. God will build your faith, not just for you, but for others. You say, are you sure about that? I'm sure about that. Remember Peter who went through that time of testing and he failed, did he not? He blew it. He blew it. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter? He looked at him before it happened. And he said to Peter, before Peter denied Jesus, he said, let me check my time. We're okay. He said to Peter, he said, Peter, when you have been restored, and Peter is thinking at that point, what do you mean be restored? Well, I don't need to be restored from anything. Peter was sure he was number one apostle. Was he not? Was Peter sure he was number one apostle? He was. He, he, he went to the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was closer to him than any others. Oh, the revelation of God, the closeness of God, the blessing, the truth of God poured out. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, when you have been restored, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers. Paul had to have this to go through and to do what God had called him to do. May I say something to you brothers and sisters this morning? You and I don't know now, but in heaven you and I will know how much of our spiritual DNA comes from Paul. I mean that. It comes from Paul. And if Paul had not been willing to go through this and pray, God, take it from me, and then to accept what God says. When God says what? What does He say? What does He say? God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient. And Paul accepted it. And Paul took it. If Paul had not accepted that, if Paul had grown bitter, if Paul had said, God, that's not fair. I have loved you. I've served you. I've given my life. I've been rejected by my own people, the Jews. And you're letting me go through this? It's not fair. It's not right. And his heart had grown bitter. And he had turned or had slowed down or had said, I'm going to take an easier way. No, God, I do not accept this. Take it from me. I don't want it. I'm not going to have it. No, God. And to give an ultimatum to God, which we sometimes do. I believe many of us would not be sitting here this morning. I believe that. I believe that. But Paul says, I now understand this is what God was doing. This is why God. I think if Paul had any temptation to sin, I think it would have been a temptation to pride. Don't you think so? And I think that's pretty clear when we look at the writings of Paul as he talks about that. You know what? If anybody could have been a proud Christian, Paul could have been a proud Christian. He really could have been. God took him to heaven. He had all of this spiritual pedigree. But, and you know what's interesting? And we'll talk about this at the end. What God showed Paul in heaven, Paul was not allowed to tell. Did you know that? You say, what? You go back and read 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says, I am not permitted to say what I saw and what I heard in heaven. It was, it was to do something in Paul as he went forward. He could not say anything, and he did not say anything about it. And in fact, when God took him to heaven, Paul did not come down and go to the first church and say, guess what, brothers and sisters, I was taken to heaven. Today we would go on a TV show, wouldn't we? And we'd tell every detail about it, wouldn't we? As, as, as people do. And, and God uses things for His glory. I, I'm, I, but Paul kept it in his heart, kept it silent but he accepted what God did. And I want us to look at this. We see that what God says in answer to Paul's prayer, first of all, 
God gives no answer, does he? Three times Paul prayed, and the implication is God is silent to his prayer. You say, is that exactly what it says? No, it's not exactly what it says. But the implication is God didn't answer, just didn't answer. Paul prays fervently. So at first, no answer. And then when the answer does come, it's not the answer he wants. Yeah? How many of you, God, you've prayed for something and God has given you an answer you did not want? And you knew it was God's answer. Yeah? Me too, Pastor. Me too. And then I knew it was God. I knew it was God. And I thought, God, I don't want this answer. He said, what? No deliverance? You're going to give me grace? I don't want grace. I want deliverance. And we often do, don't we? We, we, want, del cause we want deliverance. Because you know what? Deliverance is easier than grace. It is. Deliverance is easier in grace. But may I say something to you? Deliverance, and sometimes God does deliver. It is God's will at times to deliver. He does. But by and large, in our lives, grace does more in our lives and in our Christian character than deliverance does. It does. And so we look at this, and God says, my grace is sufficient. He doesn't give an explanation. And I want you to see this morning as we come to a close. When God gives the answer, do you see that? When God gives the answer, even in giving the answer, He does not yet give an explanation. Brothers and sisters, I think that's even harder. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. God, I don't understand. And God does not yet give an answer. The answer, the uh, sorry, God does give an answer. He doesn't give an explanation. The explanation, the understanding, doesn't come until later. It doesn't come until later. And sometime later, Paul is able to say, it was so that I wouldn't get proud because of those revelations I had. Now pause with me and think for just a minute. The Bible has so much to say about pride, right? What if Paul, what if God had removed that stake in his flesh and Paul had become proud. His ministry would have been limited, damaged, and destroyed because God does not use the proud, does He? God runs from pride in our lives and God runs from pride in a church, which is why we humble ourselves before Him and let Him take care of it. If Paul had understood in the beginning, oh, God, I might get proud. This is why it's come. Do you know what? Paul wouldn't have prayed. Because we know Paul, don't we? We know his character and we know his life. And we know that Paul would have said, Oh God, this is your will. Got it. Got it, God. Okay, I'm not going to pray at all. Yes, this is your will. We know that it wasn't because he kept on praying. And that's how we know that God first didn't give an answer. And then God gave an answer he didn't want. And then finally, God gave an explanation. Keep your focus here, folks. Keep your focus here. And so we see God's hand in all of this. We see what He's doing. We're going to skip some slides, Wilma. Um, and let's look at uh, slide 9. Let's look at slide 9. So we're going to go ahead. By the way, I encourage you to read Peter as well. Go forward to slide 9. And here's the response. Let's, can we start just with this one first, without this one? Can we take this off and take this off, please? Just this. Yeah. That's okay. We'll get there. Hang on. Okay. Let's look just at this. So what does Paul say? When God says, my grace is sufficient for you, what does Paul say? He says, therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So because of Christ, I'm pleased in weaknesses, in insults, in catastrophes, in persecutions, and in pressures. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. May we paraphrase that this morning? In other words, and this is for us now, keep your focus. I am going to accept what God gives me in this situation. That's what this means. I'm going to accept what, God's, what God gives me. How else does Paul respond in his life? Look at the next scripture, Philippians 
I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Or the Amplified says, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. And what that means is Paul, who was a very, very strong guy, a very strong character, chooses, I'm not going to do it in my own strength, but in my weakness, I'm going to lean on God and then I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then, what else does he say? Look at the next one, Philippians 4.10. Uh, four, sorry, 4.11. He says, I have learned, can you see that? Let me back up. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. To be content. He says, I've learned this. May I encourage you this morning as we close. Paul didn't learn this immediately. It was a lesson. And sometimes you and I struggle as we go through things that we don't understand. May I say to you, give yourself some grace and let God take you through it and let, and, and let us learn from it. Paul says, I've learned to be content. That means it was a process. That means it was not a gift from God. That means God didn't just say, boom, here, now you will be content. God doesn't do it that way. We learn because He's working on us and He's working on our hearts. And we close with this this morning. Let's look at that very last slide. The Lord will provide sufficient grace. Or as God says, my grace is sufficient for you. We started with Abraham. We end with Paul. And I've used that as our last thing to look at because we remember Abraham and we remember what, did, what he said. Remember what he said? The Lord will provide, right? The Lord will provide. And the Lord did provide, didn't he? The Lord provided what he needed to give the sacrifice, to have a right attitude, and to have a lamb to offer to the Lord. And for Paul... My grace is sufficient. What does the word sufficient mean? Give me an easy word for it. Enough. Just a simple word. Enough. My grace is enough. It's not a big, huge thing. It's enough. It's enough. Sometimes you and I, we feel like we're drowning, don't we? We feel like we're drowning. When we say, God, I don't understand. Why is this going on? This is too hard. And God gives us enough grace. We don't. Walk on the water always, brothers and sisters. But sometimes the grace is, it's always enough to lift our heads above the water so that we don't drown. We close with this. I told you that Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 at the beginning, he says, I was caught up to heaven. I don't know if it was a vision. I don't know if I really went to heaven. And then Paul says, but I am not allowed to speak of the things I saw. Now take this to heart as we close this morning. Paul could not say what he saw in heaven and the words that he heard. But do you know what he could say to you and to me this morning? The words of God? The words that he was permitted to say to you and to me are these words. My grace is sufficient. That should encourage you this morning. Paul he doesn't tell of the glories of heaven. He's not allowed to tell of the glories of heaven. There's this and there's that. What he is allowed to say are the words that God speaks to Paul in the valley when he does not understand, when the messenger of Satan is not taken from his life. And may I say to you that we don't know if that messenger of Satan stayed in Paul's life the rest of his life. The Bible does not tell us. But what Paul said for his life and for your life and for my life is this. God's grace is sufficient. And those are the words that we take this morning. God, I don't understand. My grace is sufficient. God, this is bad. My grace is sufficient. God, it's not fair. My grace is sufficient. God, please, don't you love me? My grace is sufficient. God, we come to you this morning. Lord, some of us, we need this for our own lives right now. 
Lord, some of us, this is what we're going to need tomorrow or a week from now or a year from now. Or Lord, some of us this morning, we can now look back at things in our own lives and we can say, oh, okay, Lord, you got me through. You didn't deliver me, but you got me through. Your grace is sufficient. And so, Lord, I can do all things through you because you give me strength. Lord, I have determined and I am committed that I will learn to be content in the circumstances that you permit and that you allow in my life. God, I will not let the enemy defeat me in this. God, I will not be overcome by evil or bitterness. God, I choose to see your hand of victory and grace and love and control in my life. I will say as Paul said, Okay, Lord, I accept and I will delight in the things that make me weak because then I am strong in you and you are glorified in my life. God, I'm going to say that too. God, I want to bring many people with me as I go through this life, not just myself, before your throne one day, but Lord, my family members, my loved ones, my friends, my classmates, my co-workers, Lord, my employer. Lord, I want to bring them to you. Take me through. May your grace be sufficient in our lives, in my life. You're a good God and you love me. You're a good God and you have a good plan for my life. You're a good God and you control my life and no other. In the name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Before you leave,